Hi and welcome. Thank you for joining me in this presentation. I'm Ray Trevison, Fund Manager and Director at OTG Capital. And today I'm going to talk to you about bonds and your investing health. Now, this particular topic is uh, the subject of my fourth e-booklet. So I've actually got three other e-booklets which include uh, an introduction to bonds and six factors about investing in bonds and also six factors in assessing collateral. And so to round those particular uh, those particular um, presentations and articles, I've done this one on bonds and your investing health and why I believe investing in bonds is good for your investing health and also good for your personal health. So uh, without uh, further ado, let's get stuck in. Here's some information about uh, me as the fund manager and director at OTG Capital. Uh, I've been in the finance game now and investing for quite a while. I've been in business and business management. I also run a regular radio show and podcast called Dollars and Making Sense, which I broadcast every Tuesday morning on Radio Northern Beaches uh, in my local area. And you can also stream that live on the web at the Radio Northern Beaches website. And that particular link is there on your slide deck. So let's talk about bonds and why I like bonds. Now, as I said, I've previously written about bonds and why I focus on them. And I have a thing for them, not because I necessarily like James Bond uh, or a particular brand of underwear or my corny dad jokes, uh, but it's more a case of my age. I've become a bit more conservative and I'm certainly closer to retirement uh, these days than I was 20 or 30 years ago. And I guess the, the main reason I like bonds is it suits my risk tolerance and my uh, profile of uh, as, a, as an investor. I'm a lot more conservative these days and so I like to keep my blood pressure in a healthy range and I believe that investing in bonds uh, provides uh, that nice balance of being able to get uh, what I consider a modest and decent return without putting the house uh, and everything else on it at the same time. Have I traded shares? Yes, absolutely. I have actual day trading experience. About 10 years ago, I was trading right at the peak of the GFC. And uh, I must say, I did reasonably well. But uh, even with having a great annualized result, the side effects were a lack of sleep, no fingernails, a frayed nervous system, and a very, very cranky wife. And so when I look at the year that we've uh, been going through, and we're only two thirds of the way through, the All Ordinaries started the year at 68.10, peaked at above 7,000, and has fluctuated from historic highs, uh, certainly back to lows in historically fast times. And, uh, oh, by the way, did I mention the fact that it's also been unprecedented? Haven't we got sick of that word? And so through all of this, I would simply ask you as an investor, if you are big into equities and stocks and the like, how's your blood pressure doing so far this year? Have you been able to take advantage of these great fluctuations, which I know many good traders can, but there aren't that many of them out there. And so I simply look at this equity graph uh, of the All Lords at the moment and wonder whether everybody's been able to make the best of it. Whereas in contrast, the corporate bond rates over this period of time have eased somewhat in line with the easing of the RBA cash rate, which is now holding at 25 basis points. And there is some discussion around whether it will drop to 10 basis points or potentially go negative. But bond yields have remained consistent and stable since the beginning of this year, as tumultuous as it has been, and was consistent through most of 2019. So people will always argue me and say, Ray, shares will always outperform bonds. And I guess what? I don't disagree they will always outperform bonds because of the fact that there is a better opportunity to make money in fluctuating shares, whereas bonds tend to have a, a far more stable and predictable uh, path that they go down. And so if you look at the statistics, they're compelling and they tell the truth that over the long haul, shares have always outperformed bonds. But the reason I like bonds is they suit my risk tolerance and they suit who I am as an investor. And that's all there is to it. Now, 
I'm not a total conservative and with everything tied up in cash deposits. I do understand my money, my money does need to work hard to beat inflation and tax, but I'm just not comfortable following the masses into blue chip stocks that deliver the occasional big bang. And while not everybody jumped on these shares to make extraordinary profits, of those who did, how many investors actually confessed to their mistakes? And so, yes, everyone will talk the big game of how they bought CSL at the beginning or a one on Afterpay and, you know, A2 Milk's been great for me. But I don't know how many are out there saying, well, maybe I shouldn't have bought that utility back when it was floated. And, uh, gee, that uh, electronics store that uh, was uh, bought by hedge fund and, uh, and then floated. Wow, didn't we take a pasting on that? And. While it's consistent that shares do deliver better returns than bonds and cash over a long period of time, it only works if you buy and hold a reasonable basket and you withstand that temptation to exit or panic buy poor choices. And again, I've pulled some graphs here for you to look at. And comparatively over a long period of time, Bonds are outperformed by shares, but they don't do too badly. And this comparative one, for example, you know, looks at you know, about a 20% differential over that period of time. And obviously people can pick and choose the graphs that suit, but I will never ever argue black and blue that bonds will outperform stocks. They don't, they absolutely don't. Now, I'll also acknowledge in this as well that many investors buy Australian blue chip shocks, stocks purely for the frank, franking credits, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'd contend to you that these franking credits are in fact a heavily subsidised government rebate, which performs similar to a bond. And so in effect, what people are looking for is a standardised dividend that comes through with a tax refund if they are in that situation with the government and that then acts like a bond. They're getting a regular quarterly or whatever period that dividend payment is made. And given the recent uh, and, and news that we're now getting about dividend payments, that holiday and uh, free ride on dividends and franked credits may be short lived with the cutting of dividends and many companies announcing during this torrid time that they're not going to be paying the kind of dividends that they have in the past. And so what are we left with? Stock picking. Now, I've done stock picking. It's not easy. And people that think that it is, I just think you're kidding yourselves, quite frankly. Look, there are good stock pickers out there and there's research and there's software that can do that. And there's trend investments that you can go through with exchange traded funds, or you can put your money with an MDA, a managed discretionary account. Nothing wrong with any of these. But I, again, I push back and say, Buffett, you know, Warren Buffett, the, you know, the Oracle of Omaha has proved beyond a shadow of doubt in his 10 year bet with hedge fund managers, the professionals, that he was able to beat them with indexed funds every time. Nobody's been able to beat Buffett on that. And even Buffett gets it wrong as well. And a recent study by Goldman Sachs shows that 80% of managed equity funds here locally didn't outperform the index. Now, remembering you're probably playing, paying one or 2% of a performance fee for these professional managers to at least do better than the index. Because if you go to a Vanguard or if you go to a beta shares or whatever and simply buy an ASX 200 ETF, you're going to follow the index. And if four fifths of the managed, professionally managed equity funds out there can't beat that ETF, then my question is why bother? So, People keep equating bonds with the kind of things that you hear about with treasury bonds that are earning sub 1% and the like. And I don't disagree, but not all bonds are in that category. There are lots and lots of types of bonds in the market, including government, corporate municipal bonds. So you can actually buy bonds from players like Microsoft or BHP. You don't have to buy their shares. You can actually, you can actually lend them your money and they will pay you a rate of return. There are unregulated and unlisted uh, bonds and there are asset backed and collateralized bonds, which is what we specifically do, for example, here at OTG Capital. So if you look at that risk return graph there on your slide, there are many ways of doing bonds, some that will pay very conservatively and some that are the Wild West and you are taking your life in your hands. So you can be just as risk averse or risky 
investing in a bond just as you would with equities. So I guess from my perspective, local bonds provide a consistent way forward. It's higher on the risk profile than cash deposits. I will never ever dispute, they are. But for example, with a, a comparative yield curve that we're looking here, what I've charted here for you is a look at what the All Lords has done in the past year and then comparing, for example, with my own fund, if you simply put in the same amount at the beginning and you can see it tracks along quite nicely and the ASX is doing better. But then we hit that big roadblock at the beginning of the year when COVID hit and we've got the steady climb back. Now, one could argue if the economy bounces back, we'll be doing better than a bond. I don't dispute that. I absolutely don't dispute that. But for mine, for me, a bond is simple. I lend money out and I make sure it comes back and I take a margin on that interest rate that we bill for the money. We provide modest to strong returns, but the thing that I like is there's no drama. So you see that nice steady equity curve, that blue line rather than the ups and downs of the orange. Now for some, they love that. Uh, but again, if you're a trustee at an SMSF and you've got to start looking after your retirement, I would contend yet again that there is a risk profile that you've got to start taking into consideration that as you get older, I don't know if it's necessarily worth your while going down that path. And given that dividends are not going to provide the kind of returns that people are looking for, I think bonds is the next natural place for people to start looking and looking quite critically at, can I then invest in bonds and do reasonably well? Will it be an A2? Will it be a CSL? Will it be an afterpay? Most likely not. But will it be an absolute tanker? No, it won't be that either. So I simply reiterate, we've got modest to strong returns and without the drama. So what's next? Many people are hoping or praying that this pandemic will sort of finish up and by the end of the year, we'll be back to normal. I have a few people that uh, I know that work for Qantas they're not scoping on anything realistically happening with international travel until at least the end of 2021. And when you figure that tourism is either our second or third uh, industry in this country, depending on which measure you may look at, uh, we've still got a long way to go with this pandemic. There's a lot of talk about a potential uh, vaccine out there. I think much of that is very premature and there's a fair bit of partisan politics uh, in play when people start thinking that that's going to actually happen and that we're out of the woods. I think we've still got a long way to go. And many people that I'm reading, all the experts, and I'm not an expert, but I do a lot of reading, this recovery is going to take quite a long time. And to get back to the kind of levels that we were looking at at the beginning of the year, we could be looking at any period of time beyond 23 and 2024. 20, and so you know, we're looking at quite a while. Now, if you're lucky enough to be able to be able to pick the bottom of an equities market, good luck to you. I don't know many people that actually can though. And without insider trading information, then I don't know what's normally a good guess or just a lot of dumb luck or a lot of hope. So my argument, ladies and gentlemen, for bonds being part of anyone's portfolio simply comes down to the right along the way. You know, are you looking for that roller coaster or are you more content with running up that gentle slope and seeing that equity curve in a nice gentle way? And as I say, there's no drama. And so from that perspective, for mine, bonds are so much better because my blood pressure is a lot better. My wife certainly enjoys me being in my bed a lot longer and not being up in all hours of the night trying to trade my equities and and hopefully squeeze a few more percentage points of yield. And so, yes, I'm not making as much, but my blood pressure is better. My fingernails have grown a lot better. And uh, yeah, my health is all the better for it. And so I guess from that perspective, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you give bonds a serious consideration. I've got some uh, cool ebooks for you to download, which are free off our website. I'd encourage you to look at them. There's no pressure there, just read them. I'd be certainly very keen to hear your feedback. And uh, if you think that we can improve those books or uh, the details not there, because these are very entry level books that I've written on bonds, but that's what I really wanna do. I wanna introduce bonds to a lot of people. The market research that I've got tells me that 
barely 6 to 7% of people in Australia invest in bonds. And I think that's a travesty because there's some good, solid returns to be made in bonds here locally. But like anything else, educate yourself and understand what you're investing in. So thanks for watching. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, any of the questions that you may have and catch up with me uh, after this presentation at our virtual booth or contact me through our normal socials, email, my website, etc. And please also understand that all of the information and uh, documentation I'm providing today in conjunction with the SMSF Association is accompanied with our disclaimer that this presentation is for general information only. And I've made every effort to make sure the information is accurate, but please understand that I'm preparing this information without taking into account any personal objectives, financial situation or needs. And should you need personal advice, please contact your financial advisor or a uh, finance professional for professional advice. Again, thank you kindly for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.